The Sanad allows scholars to pretty much understand which narration we should accept and which narration we should not accept. Because if the Sanad was strong enough, that means that the text was also accepted. What happened when the Sanad was weak? They would what? Look for other chains that establish the same meaning. So if a hadith was weak from one chain and other chains were established, this would bring it up to the level of Hassan. Because now there are enough chains to give support to one another, right? And that's, that, that, that is enough for us to accept that this hadith is correct. What is the strongest sanad? Scholars speak about what is the strongest sanad? One of the strongest sanads is the sanad of Nafi'. So Al Malik, Al Nafi' and Salim. So which is just for the sake of understanding, Al Malik, Al Nafi' and Salim, they say is the strongest sanad. Others say the sanad, sanad of Shihab al Zuhri is the strongest sanad. Ibn Hajar says that there is no name that is used more in Sahih al Bukhari as a narrator, more so than the name of Ibn Shihab al Zuhri, who we spoke about in the first session. He was the person that Umar al-Azir asked to compile a book that could become the constitution of hadith. And he did so, but he passed away. So Imam Malik, his student, went ahead and completed that book in his own form known as Mawta Imam Malik. So his name is used the most often in Sahih Bukhari. So they say that he had, his sanad is the strongest sanad. So this is for the sake of understanding. So there are several narrations in which the Prophet warns us against falsely lying about him. So we already spoke about that. And when was this idea formed and when was it strengthened by the end of the first century, which I mentioned the narration of Sufyan ibn Ariyana, that prior to that, we did not need to uh, ask about the Senate because everyone was speaking the truth. How about today's time? We have to ask the Gua in every way possible, just, just to be sure. So right here is an example of what we call the expansion of the Isnad. There's something called Adl al-Ruwat and the other is called Sifat al-Ruwat. And a compiler of a book of Hadith will look at both. They will look at how can I get a text, a matan, with the least people between me and the Prophet sallallahu So you have the least number of people between me and the source. In today's time as well, you always want to do what in business? Unfortunately, you want to get rid of the middleman. The, le the less middlemen you have, the better it is for your profit, right? Because there's too many people in between. There's too many cooks in the kitchen. So you want to get rid of the middleman so you can work directly with your source. Similarly, when it came to hadith, the goal of these compilers of these books and these scholars of hadith was to find a chain that was the shortest to the Prophet ﷺ. The shorter it was, it all, that meant that there were less people in between and less people that were strong, it creates a stronger senate. And then now rather than me having to cross-reference five people, I only have to cross-reference three people. And those three people are already well-known. And if they were well-known, you wouldn't even cross-reference them. But if a person, a narrator of hadith, was not known within the circles of scholars, that was considered to be a flaw within them. That if you are a narrator of hadith, why are you not known in your own circles? It wasn't about being known in public spaces. That was the job of what we would call the qassasun, the storytellers. The storytellers were such people. Storytellers at that time were very dominant. They were well known. They were the ones that would have the biggest audience in front of them. But no, it was, it was, it was a fact that no one would ever accept a hadith from them. Because they were what? Storytellers. And what do storytellers do? Exaggerate. All right. They sometimes even, what we say, add masala. Add spice. And you can even lie. There's no such thing as exaggeration in hadith. So they would have the biggest gatherings. But the hadith was never accepted. So one day, one of the students, Imam Hanifa, rahimahullah, walked into a gathering. In the masjid, there was Imam Hanifa teaching fiqh and hadith. And in the same masjid, there was this man who was what? In a different part of the masjid, who was a qassas, like he was a storyteller. And he was telling a story, he was really into it, and he was really enthusiastic, we were excited. So this man, this youngster, was like, ah, where should I go? 
that seems like it's good, but this seems like it's well, it's really popping here. So let me just let me go there. So he went ahead and he went there. The next one that walked in was Imam Muhammad. Rahimullah. He walked in and he saw, of course, I'm going to go to my, my class. So later on, Imam Hanifa said to the other student, so why'd you go there for? So, you know, because I wanted to see what's going on and I wanted, you know, everyone was sitting there, it was a big crowd. So I went there. He said, okay, that's fine. You will perhaps get masses of people to follow you, but you will never have masses of people to learn from you. Because you went for masses of following, to listen to you. But not people that will learn from you. We have his name recorded. He doesn't have many students, that person. Now, Muhammad became one of the strongest students of Imam Muhannif. So the Qasasun, or you could say the, the speakers, for the sake of the example, right, were well known in the area, but they were never accepted within the circles of Hadith. And the scholars of Hadith were actually not as well known amongst the public. Because they were not coming out giving lectures every day. Their classes were what? Very specific to a niche audience. But they were well known within their circles. So if you didn't know a person's name, it was either because he's not a strong narrator or because he has not entered within the circle of the scholars of hadith. So they would cross-reference him. Like how Ustad Naisir was saying, they would actually have delegations. We'll talk about jarh wa ta'adil. They would have groups of people that would go to a community and they would say, do you know so-and-so person? His name is Abdullah ibn Hamid. And they would say, yeah, yeah, of course we know him. But, oh, you know, how is he? Do you do business with him? It's like, yeah, yeah, I do. How are you? He's never lied to me. Does he come for Salat on time? Like, imagine someone asking behind your back if you uh, come for Salat on time. Like, oh, worry about yourself, man. You're going to go to Jahannam too then. They're like, imagine people. That, and guess what? Because the treasure of deen was bigger than them, there was no sensitivities attached to it. It wasn't like, how can they ask about me? They're not asking about, they, don't, they actually don't care about you. That's just the reality of the fact. They don't care, they don't care about you. They care about the deen that you're trying to spread. So if you are not accepted, and if you're someone that is compromised, you are compromising our sharia. That's why we care about you. We are not people that are known or people that care about us. Because of where we came from and who we are. They care about us because of what we hold. And if we're not able to uphold it correctly, then they have the right to criticize correctly. So this is how, this is how deep they would go. They would literally go to an extent of asking about their salat. Have you seen? There was one narration where Ibn Hajar rahimullah mentions one of the narrators of Bukhari, which he was unsure about, he found out whether or not he would miss the Fajr Sunnah to make sure his dhabt was established. Okay, you pray for, okay, you know what? That means he must be what? A truthful person. 